preach to you this afternoon. I'd like to go back to Hebrews chapter 9. We were in Hebrews chapter 10 this morning, but I'd like to go back to Hebrews chapter 9 and notice some of the lessons that the apostle gives us concerning Jesus. We did look at Hebrews chapter 9 this morning and verse 14 where Paul says that Jesus Christ offered himself without spot to God. I want to drop, I want to, I want to notice with you this afternoon in, in Hebrews chapter 9 what I would call the three appearances of Jesus Christ on behalf of his people. And first of all, I'd like to look at verse 26. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 26. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. If Jesus had been like the other priest in Israel, he would have had to have made many sacrifices, but he was different. And this passage tells us, but now once in the end of the world hath he appeared. That's our subject this afternoon, the appearance of Christ. Hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. This verse says that Jesus appeared in the end of the world. What world is under consideration here? Obviously, it's not talking about the created world. It's still with us, and we're still enjoying it today. So what world is under consideration? But now once in the end of the world, hath he appeared. I believe the, the world under consideration is the, the mosaic world, the world of the law. That was coming to an end. It had served its purpose. God had appeared to Moses at Sinai. He had given him the law. He had given him the pattern for the tabernacle. And the animal sacrifices began in the tabernacle. And, and that was the world of the law. And, uh, but thank God that has come to an end. You know, Jesus said, or, or John said in John chapter 1, um, in the gospel of John chapter 1, the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Think about that. The law was given by Moses. And the law was perfect. There was nothing wrong with the law because a perfect God gave a perfect law. The problem was that perfect law demanded us to live perfect. And none of us even come close to being perfect. And so the law world came to an end. And so John says the, the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Jesus brought grace into this world. But Jesus appeared at the end of the old Jewish world. And Jesus was born under the law. He was obligated to keep the law. And he did keep the law to a jot and to a tittle. He kept Moses' law perfectly. He was under the law. But now once in the end of the world, the end of the old law world, hath he appeared. That's past tense. And, and when did Jesus appear? Well, he appeared when he was born of the Virgin Mary, lived for 33 years in his body on this earth, a sinless and perfect life. And then at the end of that life, he put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. That's the last sacrifice, animal, that's the last blood sacrifice that God has ever recognized. 
And you know, it's interesting, beloved. God never did require Israel in the Old Testament to make human sacrifices. God never required that. Animal sacrifices was what he required. There was one time that God did require a human sacrifice when God called Abraham to offer up his son Isaac. But before Abraham brought the knife down and plunged it into the flesh and blood of his son Isaac, God stayed his hand. So God never required a human sacrifice in the Old Testament. Unfortunately, Israel got involved in human sacrifices. Did I say God didn't require animal sacrifices? I'm, I'm tired, so a tired preacher is dangerous. <laughs> God did not require human sacrifices under the law. He didn't require it at any time except in the case of Abraham. And in that case, God stayed Abraham's hand before he actually took his son's life. And why did God require that of Abraham? Well, Jesus said in John's gospel, your, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. When did Abraham see the day of Jesus Christ? I think he saw it in the mount when God required Abraham to take his son's life. God was showing Abraham what it was going to cost God the Father to save all of us. It was going to take the sacrifice of God's Son. And God was showing that to Abraham in a type and in a shadow in the Old Testament. Aren't y'all glad God does not require us to offer up our children as blood sacrifices? He only required that once, and that was to show Abraham what was going to happen on Mount Moriah when Jesus, the Son of God, would be offered. And that day, nobody would step in to save Jesus. Now, as I said, Israel, unfortunately, got involved in human sacrifices and I think it was probably the very darkest period in Israel's history when they were influenced by the Canaanites of the land and began to offer their children. This is too awful to talk about. You talk about R-rated. This is R-rated. I won't go into a lot of detail, but the Canaanites were offering their children as sacrifices to Moloch. Moloch was an idol god, and as I understand it, he, his arms, now he's, he's an idol god made with human hands. His arms were held out. You know, we have a statue here in Birmingham, the Vulcan. How many of y'all have ever seen the Vulcan? That's quite an iron statue, isn't it? Well, just imagine Moloch being built by men with his arms stretched out like this, and his chest was a furnace of fire. And those Canaanites would take their little children and put them in the arms of Moloch alive, and they would roll down into that burning furnace as a sacrifice. And Israel, let me tell you folks, you can be influenced by this world. And we don't need to be influenced by this world. We shouldn't be they began to take part in that. Offering Hebrew children to this idol god named Moloch. And you know what God said about that? God said, I didn't command it, neither entered it into my mind. I don't know what absoluters do with that verse. I think they just ignore it. Because God is plainly saying to Israel and to the world, I had nothing to do with that. I didn't command them to do it. It didn't enter into my plans at all. That's a wicked thing that Israel was doing. But even if you offered your children as a blood sacrifice, it wouldn't take away sin. Because our children, as much as we love them, they're sinners. And it would be a sinful sacrifice. 
And God requires a perfect, sinless sacrifice. And there's only been one of them. And that's his son, Jesus, who kept the law perfectly. Now, he has appeared once in the end of the world. Why? To put away sin. He didn't come down here on an experiment. He's not an ex he wasn't operating an experiment at Calvary to see what could be done. He died on that cross to put away sin. How did he do it? By the sacrifice of himself. Now, when Jesus died on that cross, I tried to get into this this morning. Who was he dying for? He was dying for the sanctified. He was dying for the elect. He was dying for the brethren. He was dying for the children. He was dying for those that God had given him. So let's back up just a moment here in Hebrews chapter 9 and look at an interesting verse. Verse 16. For where a testament is... There must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is, is a force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. Now, brother and sister, that, those verses are full of wonderful truth. Now, I think what the writer is teaching us is that God has a testament. And a testament is like a last will. And, you know, if a person has some earthly possessions on this earth, it's wise for them to have a last will. And if you went into a lawyer's office and you said, sir, I want to have a will. I want to write a will. And, and the lawyer says, well, who do you want to be the uh, heirs of your will? And you said, well, nobody in particular, <laughs> just everybody in general. The lawyer would say, well, you don't need a will. <laughs> if you're just going to leave what you've got to everybody in general, you don't need a will. But if you want to leave it to somebody in particular, you need a will, right? Well, let me tell you, Jesus Christ has a will. And in that will, he has his heirs. And, 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 and I believe he has their names written down. You know the Lamb's Book of Life? You know what it is? It's not a book like this Bible where it's got verses and context and all that. It's not like a novel or the Encyclopedia Britannica. Uh, the Lamb's Book of Life, I believe, is a book full of names. That's all there is in there is names. And you know whose names are in there? Those that the Lamb died for. You say, well, Brother Sam, is my name in there? I don't know. But I suspect it is if you're hanging around for a Sunday afternoon service. That's a pretty good indication that you love God and you're included in the family. Yes, sir? And when were these names written in the Lamb's Book of Life? I believe they were written in there by God before the foundation of this world. And some people say, well, God's got a pen with an eraser on it. If you don't behave yourself, he erases your name. And if you'll repent, he'll write your name back in. Well, it'd have to be good paper to hold up because a lot of us, <laughs> we'd be erasing and writing constantly, wouldn't he? No, sir, if your names have ever been written in the Lamb's Book of Life, uh, it'll be there forever. And why is it called the Lamb's Book? Because it's the, it's the names of the people the Lamb died for. And why is it called the Lamb's Book of Life? Because everyone the Lamb died for will have eternal life. It's a book of life. Wow. And everyone whose names are in that book, Jesus died for them, and they're his heirs. And, and he's got a testament or a will. But you know, a will is not a, in effect until the death of the lawyer who wrote it. <laughs> no. A will is not effective until the death of the testator, the writer of the will, right? Now, now how do you get included in somebody's will? Let's say you know a millionaire and you, you go up to him and he, you say, hey... Mr. Jones, I, 
uh, you're getting on up in years and you're not going to live long and you've got a lot of money, would you please include me in your will? You think that'd get you in? I don't think so. <laughs> but if it could be proven in court that you influenced the writer of the will to include you in the will, that will would be thrown out. You see, you can't, you, you can't have an influence on the writer of the will and say, hey man, I want you to include me in your will. How many of y'all would like to volunteer to be in the last will and testament of some multi-billionaire? But you can't sign up. <laughs> That's not up to you. It's up to the writer of the will who owns the property. Well, God owns it all. Heaven is his, and he's giving it to his heirs freely that he chooses to give it to. But you today, somebody in this house may be the heir of a lot of money. Maybe an aunt or an uncle or a relative that loves you and they've included you in their will. But until they die, you don't get it. Well, I want to tell you, Jesus Christ died on the cross 2,000 years ago to make the will effective. You say, well, why don't we just go ahead and get what's ours? Well, <clears throat> the only thing standing between us and what he's given us in the will is time. That's the only thing between us. And, and with a God who is outside of time, time doesn't matter. That matters to us because we're timely creatures, but to God, it does not matter. But I want to tell you, there's no sin, there's no iniquity, there is no guilt, there is no blame between you and what is yours. Because Jesus has taken it all away. He's put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And he died to make the will effective. Let's read it again. For where a testament or a will is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. That's logical. For a testament is of force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. That brings to my mind the thought of the prodigal son. You know, when the prodigal son went to his daddy and said, I want my inheritance now, you know what that son was basically saying to his father? He said, as far as I'm concerned, you're dead. You're just as good as dead. I want what's mine now. Wasn't that a rotten attitude for that son to have? Well, I'm here to tell you this, eve, this afternoon, Jesus died on the cross to make the will effective. So his first appearance was at the end of the Jewish or law world to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. He showed up. He made an appearance, a bodily appearance. Now I want to look at the second appearance in our, in our chapter today. Let's go back to verse 24. You say, well, Brother Sam, yeah, I, I, I'm happy that we're all going to heaven in the by and by, but I'm in the now and now, <laughs> and I got problems and heartaches and burdens, and I got all kind of things to deal with. I need help now. What's Jesus doing for me now? Well, let's look at it. Verse 24, for Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, that would be the temple in Jerusalem or the tabernacle, but into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God for us. Did you know that Jesus Christ is right now, this very moment, it's seven minutes after two uh, central time in Alabama. Did you know that right this moment, Jesus Christ is appearing in heaven for us? That's right. At the right hand of God, he is our mediator. He is our intercessor. He is our friend. And, and the Bible says that he is appearing now, now to appear in the presence of God for us. And uh, I'm glad to tell you this afternoon that Jesus never sleeps. He never takes a nap. I tell you, this past two weeks, sleep has never been so sweet to me as it was. I could sleep for 12 hours and then take an hour and a half nap in the afternoon. <laughs> I mean, I needed it. That, that rest is medicine to your body when you're sick. You need rest. There's no substitute for rest for the physical body when you are sick and getting over an illness. But God is not sick and he's not tired. And the Bible says he neither sleeps nor slumbers. So when you need him, he's there. You don't ever get a 
answering machine or a secretary. You don't ever get any of that. He is available, and you and I need to remember that, and we can call on him at any time of the day or night because he is heaven in heaven now to appear in the presence of God for us. Now let's look at the final appearance of Jesus Christ. Let's come down to verse 28. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of how many? Many. <laughs> Not a few, but many. Not all, but many. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. And unto them that look for him shall he appear. There's a future appearance of Jesus Christ. Shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Beloved, Jesus Christ is coming back to this earth. And it'll be a second coming. And, and, and the text says he shall appear. That's a future event. We are waiting for that today. And the Apostle Paul said in his letter to the Thessalonians, For the Lord himself, not his angels, but himself, shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall what? Rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. You know, I was thinking about that verse this week. That sounds like magic, doesn't it? That almost sounds like a fairy tale, but it's not. It's reality. Jesus is coming back to this earth not to die on a cross. His suffering is over. He paid for sin on his first coming. He's coming back the second time to get what he paid for the first time. And I believe he's going to get everyone he died for, everyone that he saved the first time he came. And so we rejoice in that, and he's coming without sin unto salvation. So Jesus has done a lot for us. He's doing a lot for us right now, and he's going to do a lot for us in the future when he comes back. Every eye shall see him. Praise his name. We want to sing a song now and give an opportunity.